Edgeworth's Duopoly model. Students, if you have watched the earlier videos on oligopoly, by now you must have understood that there was a need to develop so many models in oligopoly simply because the firms are few, the relationship between firms seems to be quite different from the way firms were related to each other in the perfect market or in the monopolistic market and certainly not the way it is in uh, uh, monopoly. There seems to be a kind of uh, a relationship between these few firms which in some sense uh, one firm depends upon the other firm for taking its decision. And the competitive market does not seem to be able to provide an answer to price or output determination. So by now we have done the Kurnos model and the Bertrand's model as important uh, models where we found that Kurno explained the oligopoly market by using a simplified model of duopoly and uh, shared that when we change the output, how do firms try and reach equilibrium? Bertrand, on the other hand, found that it is not the output that determines the equilibrium, it's the price changes that can bring about equilibrium between firms. Now the question is, why else, what, why one more model here? So let me take you through the Edgeworth's Geopoly model. It also happens that when we understand or when we have to learn these models, often we get caught up in explaining the diagram and we also, if there is a mathematics involved in that, then the mathematics part of it is explained. And often students forget that there is a conceptual a reason why that model was uh, developed and it attempts to answer some problem which an earlier writer has not been able to answer. So it is in this context I will pre uh, present this Edgeworth model uh, simply because an Edgeworth model is again a continuation of the Bertrand and uh, Kurnos model. Uh, Francis Yesdero uh, Edgeworth was a professor of political uh, economy at the University of Oxford. His main contribution are in the areas of uh, mathematics and statistics. He uses mathematics and statistics with these to explain the many economic phenomena that he has examined. He wrote the pure theory of monopoly in 1897 and uh, that was translated into English in 1925. It was published in papers relating to political economy in three volumes and several publications. In that, uh, the well, unit is on monopoly, where he develops his idea of duopoly, and then we can see how he has presented it. What was the motivation behind Edwards presenting a duopoly model again? because the two models are ready, Kurno and Bertrand is ready. So why one more model? That's the question that I want you to answer. We know that in the Bertrand and the Kurno model, the firms come to a position of stable equilibrium. Now, we need to find out whether stable equilibrium is a reality or not. And that is what Edgeworth tries to answer. According to Edgeworth, equilibrium is indeterminate. In the sense, he maintained that it is not possible for firms to reach an equilibrium state. He started off with Kurno and he maintained that Kurno was the first step in the transition from monopoly to perfect market. Because between monopoly and perfect market, there were different forms of uh, uh, situation in the uh, market and when there are few firms, nothing yet had been developed. So Kurno's step was certainly the first step towards that. Then he challenged Kurno's model on the determinateness of the equilibrium. He questioned whether firms really will reach stable equilibrium or not. Then he went on to explain or use the Bertrand model. Now unlike Bertrand's model, Edgeworth 
uh, assumed that none of the duopolists can expand its production as much as large as it wants in this competitive market because there are physical constraints that firms will experience. Now, what was the central idea of Hedgeworth? He said, fewness in number of firms in contrast to monopoly or perfect market, equilibrium is indeterminate. This is the core of Edgeworth's duopoly model. So we can explain duopoly model with the diagram and the, uh, the original article that I was referring to has got a lot of mathematics to explain the Edgeworth model. But then we should not miss out the core of this model. And the core of the model is that equilibrium is indeterminate. Now he makes a statement. General proposition is that when, two, when more than one monopolist takes part in a system of bargain, value is indeterminate. So that is the essence of Edgeworth's model. What were the assumptions of uh, Edgeworth model? Interestingly, Edgeworth starts with the same example of Kurno of the two mineral springs. He continues with that and then he changes the example, but his original idea is from Kurno and then from Bertrand. So he assumes that there are two as uh, monopolists and each of them act independently. Then the modification he made here was that the production capacity is limited to of the firms. There are constraints on the production uh, capability of the firms. Then there is a decreasing cost condition which he has taken for convenience to show that the firms cannot expand output beyond a certain level. He also says that both the firms face a linear demand curve. There are a large number of sellers and these large number, each of the, uh, the sorry, there are a large number of buyers and each of these buyers purchase a small part of the market. So this is a characteristic towards the um, a perfect market where we see large number of buyers and sellers. So large number of sellers are not there, but large number of buyers are there and they seem to purchase a small part of the total produce. And the simplest case of rival articles, he uses the word rival articles to show that we are talking about substitutes for each other and these uh, substitutes are actually identical. Something like what Bertrand and uh, Kurno said, the products are identical and they are homogeneous. But later, if uh, one reads through the paper, one would also find that he has explained in terms of complement groups also. Now, let's uh, use, so the central theme is now known to you. It is, he was trying to prove that equilibrium under the geopoly condition is indeterminate and that what Bertrand and Purno had presented is not possible in the model that uh, in real life that he was trying to explain. Now, this diagram is taken from that article and uh, I have not changed the notations of uh, what Edgeworth has used just to show you how at the time, what kind of uh, notations were used by Edgeworth. So he talks about two firms and he presents the two firms on two sides of the axis. On the right, we have the firm A and on the uh, left, we have firm B and RC dash and RC are the two linear demand curves. One RC for firm B and R, uh, RC dash for B and RC for firm A. Now this is the two demand curves. On the middle, we have the price, which is the vertical axis Y and on the horizontal axis, we have uh, the output which is shown for both the funds. Now, so the demand, the price is given at P and at given price P, what is the total market that is uh, served and uh, what happens when the price is altered? So when the price is at P, firm A would sell OPEA the right hand side OPEA which is half of the market of firm A, which is OC. So he has used his Bertrand's idea of half market and three fourth market. The same idea is used here also. So Edgeworth takes it this way. OC is the total output of firm A 
and out of this total output of firm A, the firm at price OP is able to sell OA units of output. Since the marginal cost is zero, the firm gets a profit of OPEA. This is half of his market and the other half is left unserved. Now we look at the other side, what happens to firm B. At same price P, firm B also can sell OA dash units of output at price P and obtains a revenue of OP, E dash and uh, A dash. So the total market served by both the firms together is A, A dash, which means C, N dash, the C, A, A dash and uh, uh, A dash uh, uh, C, A, C are unserved by both the firms. You can see it on both sides. Firm A has not been able to serve AC and firm B has not been able to serve A dash C dash. So total that can be served by the market is only A dash. So together what the market is uh, being served is O A dash and O A that is total is A dash A is served out of the total market of C dash C. So the two triangles on the two sides have been left unserved by both the firms. And both of them are getting an equal share of the uh, profit of the market because the same price, at the same price, the cons consumers are divided between equally between the two firms. So this is a typical condition that we start off with the earlier one, half of the market, and the other one is also selling half of the market. Now. What is the next step that we will see? Let's now take that firm A gets this uh, uh, chance to change his pricing. He thinks that since such a lot of market is unserved, what would it be like to reduce the price? And therefore attempts to reduce the price by the red line. So he reduces his price a little and he brings it to the red line. So when he presents his uh, price at a lower than OP price, he seems to have a larger market that he can serve, which is up to OB he can actually serve. But then he can't serve so much. You can see a triangle which is beyond his capacity to produce. So the firm A sells at a price which is lower than OP and he attempts to get more customers from B to his uh, market. Now, firm A is not in a position to satisfy the entire demand in the market with that price because there is a capacity constraint on the firm. But at the same time, he is depriving the firm B from selling his uh, produce because he has taken away a part of the consumers from firm B to his side. So OB is three-fourth uh, three of the units and that is limited by the daily output. So OB is three-fourth. Now you can see there OC is the total of which three-fourth OB is what firm A is now attempting to produce and sell but he cannot sell that much because there is a physical constraint. The question now is when firm A reduces the price this way, would firm B not respond? Remember, we are not talking about oligopoly, which is of a collusive uh, model uh, nature. And uh, we need not use the word collusion at this point because Edgeworth has not talked about collusion. So at the end, we can see what can happen. As of now, we are talking about classical geopoly model and therefore it is only an action and reaction and there is no collusion or negotiation that is taking place between the two firms. Now rival firm B definitely will respond to this behavior by firm A. So rival firm will now reduce a price lower than that of what firm A has reduced the rival firm will bring down the price to the blue line. So 
P O P was the market price. Firm A, in changing its price policy, brought it down to the red red line, and in response to that, firm B now reduces its price to the blue line. So a similar thing will happen. The firm will also try to now since his price firm B's price is lower than that of firm A, he is likely to get some of his customers from the movement of people from uh, firm A to firm B. So here too, firm B will be able to uh, get some customers, but he will not be able to satisfy all the customers because he also has got constraints in capacity. Looks like that um, both the firms have uh, been having this price war with each other. They have cut the price war and Edgeworth's this idea gives uh, us a lead to understanding price wars which we do later. So there is a successive variations in price till uh, uh, the two firms successively cut the prices and they come down to a price of OP dash. Now, OP dash is the last price that both the firms can come to because beyond OP dash, both the firms will incur loss. So they would not like to um, go beyond OP dash. So it is not in the interest of either of the monopolists to lower the price below OP dash. So when we look at it, we seem to have reached uh, the equilibrium at OP dash with uh, o, uh, firm A producing OB and firm B again producing um, o, uh, B dash. So it is just that both, of the both the firms have expanded its output and they have reached uh, B dash and OB. Uh, so it looks like that the firms have reached equilibrium. The question here that Edgeworth wanted to answer is, will the firms stay at this price of OB dash? That's the question that Edward was attempting to answer. Now, let's see what happens to this. One of the firms thinks of raising the price. Why? Both the firms have produced the uh, largest and A has produced the maximum. So B may think that why produce that much in the market? when A is anyway producing so much. So A has assumed that B will not change the output. B has assumed that A will not change the output. Kurnos and Bertrand's models indicate to that. So here now, firm B, let us assume, takes this question, um, why, why do, B or A, why don't uh, the firm raise its price? Anyway, the firm is being served by, the market is being served by the rival firm. So the market is already flooded with goods. So what is the point in producing more? Instead of that, he can produce less and try and get more profit. That is what uh, the firm which is planning to raise the price believes in. So, and uh, look at the consumer side. The consumers have a different position. The consumers will be glad, those who have not been served by the earlier uh, uh, firm A when it reduced its price, consumers will be glad in, at any price lower than OP is fine with the firm. So lower than OP, between OP uh, uh, dash and OP, any price is fine with the consumers. So the uh, firm B now has a uh, opportunity here to raise the price and sell a lesser quantity because anyway the market is flooded with goods by the other firm. So need not fear the competition of the rival because the rival has already produced the goods and therefore uh, need not worry about that. So rival has done his worst by putting his whole supply in the market. At this point, the rival uh, best uh, the rival can do is only to raise the price to OP. So one of them will now think of raising the price to a, uh, OP. So once the price goes to AP, the other firm will not stop. So the next cycle, what will happen is the next day. Actually, he talks about day by day. So next day, what will happen is the firm, um, the rival firm will raise the price. So the next day, the rival, the next rival firm will raise the price till it reaches a maximum price of OP and then we'll find that 
the firm will now reduce the price. Now firm B will slightly reduce the price below uh, price to OP dash. And by doing this, what he does, he captures the uh, consumers of firm uh, A. So the firm A had taken all his consumers at the beginning. Now, by reducing the price, he plans to take away the consumers from A. There is a limited supply and B cater to a small market. So firm A, rather than accepting reduction in revenue, decides to reduce his price slightly below B's. So this reason that if he sells it at a higher price than B, he will lose customers because he's already sold out in the market, he has already released the goods in the market. He now decides it is better for him to reduce the price and try and sell off his goods in the market. The question is, will this attain any position of equilibrium? Will both the firms be at rest? Will it reach an equilibrium price? And that is what uh, Adjuvath came to the conclusion that both the firms under Geopoly will not be able to reach equilibrium. So this position will continue of raising the price, bringing it down, reducing the output and increasing the output continues as a cycle when two firms are there and therefore they are never going to reach a determinate position or an equilibrium position. So if you see, you know, Edgeworth is the written example. When you see, read textbooks, you'll find that the entire idea of uh, uh, Edgeworth is, um, uh, is to explain this model. This, uh, this uh, diagram is the one that is concentrated on. And we forget that the whole idea of Edgeworth was to talk about indeterminateness of demand. So it is at this uh, postgraduate level for, of students, it is important at this time to begin questioning what you are study why are we studying these models what do these models serve and why has this model uh, uh, come as a response to another existing model so only when you begin to question only when you begin to seek answers and sometimes when you don't get the answers in a regular textbook it is a good idea to go for the original and see what it feels to read the original work of the author you may not understand all of it, not necessary, because the writer would have, they are classical writers and probably um, with the kind of knowledge they have, maybe it is very high for us to understand. But it is important for us to know how did this author write, why did he write, what does it serve to us? So until we get a conceptual background ready, unless we get a conceptual uh, theory ready in our mind, moving from one theory to the other, is quite a waste of time and it may serve the purpose of an exam but not learning the subject well. So this is what was Edgeworth uh, model of geopoly. So this process will continue and both the forms will go to produce uh, maximum output and therefore Edgeworth says the price will oscillate between OP and OP dash. It is between the monopoly price and the competitive price. So between the monopoly price and competitive price, the movement will take place and there cannot be any stable equilibrium. He makes a statement. It is thus, he has used quite a number of analogies in his original article. Uh, it will be good for you to uh, locate the paper and read. In fact, in the original article was to explain uh, the relationship between monopoly and taxation. And then he goes on to explain the case of duopoly. It is thus that the stroke of a fencer is influenced by his prevision of what his adversary's parry may be. What will the adversary do in his uh, sword or fencing uh, fight? The economic fencing match may continue till one of the fencer is ruined. So in real life, instead of going between OP and OP dash, the act may be such that one of the firm may completely get ruined. It is at this point we can say that probably collusion can occur or some kind of a consolidation. He uses the word consolidation. He says that probably at this stage there is some consolidation that can uh, occur between the two firms and they may decide to become a monopoly. So pure theory does not seem to assign any stage 
at which this must stop. So pure theory believes that the market price is given and any firm can continue to be in the market as long as the firm is able to meet the quantity and the price. So here is a case where this cannot be uh, determined and it says that it is one likely outcome is there could be a consolidation between the two firms and may lead to a monopoly. So uh, thank you very much. I hope you have understood the need to look at the conceptual background of learning these models than just solving the mathematics of it or explaining the diagram and understanding that you have understood the theory. That doesn't happen like that. It is a theory that you need to understand. It's a concept behind the theory, the words, the ideas behind the theory that you need to understand so that the next theory becomes easily understandable to you. Please do uh, subscribe to this if you haven't subscribed yet and uh, also share it with your friends. It will be useful for those students who are writing the net exam and the postgraduate uh, students of economics. Uh, maybe the commerce students and management students also will find it useful. Um, so thank you very much.